Good morning, church. Today's reading comes from Matthew, chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Now let us attend to God's wisdom for us today. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. The disciples approached him and said, Do you know the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. If a blind person guides the other, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. And he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that is what defiles For out of the heart, evil intentions, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David! My daughter is tormented by a demon! But he did not answer at all. The disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs that eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment. This ends this reading of this holy word. May it be good news to us. For the next three weeks, you're stuck with me. And in this time, I want to do a series based upon the lectionary texts that are coming up. I want to talk about a concept called confession. Now, I understand as a Presbyterian talking to disciples of Christ, the concept of a statement of confession might be a controversial approach to talk to you all, seeing that our respective denominations split at some point because of this issue around standards of confession. 
Yet I want to try to understand this word and this concept in a new way that might offer up some hopefully fruitful insights. And I'm very cautious about using the word confession. I remember recently after or during a performance that my daughter was at, um, a woman sitting alongside me asked who I was and what I did, and I said, I'm a pastor in the Presbyterian Church. And she said, well, I'm Lutheran. And then she said, and I said, yeah, and we have similar confessions of faith, to which a kind of glazed, uncertain look came across her eye, and she says, you confess the same sins? Now, I understand what was going on there because we use the word confession in many formats, to confess a crime, to confess your sin. But confession is more than admitting to something. Confession is an orderly statement about what we believe, about what one believes. From this lesson, it is revealed that the value of equipping our community with a meaningful confession. That's what I take out of this text. The spiritual lesson leads the reader to understand the importance of living a lived your confession. The way I see this text is actually there are two kind of texts within it, within this lesson. The first part of the text is from verses 10 to 20, which is a story about Jesus telling a parable that what defiles you is not what you put in you, but what comes out of you. This was a challenge to many religious of that time, and even some of our own time, who think that if you put good things into you, you will be a good person. The challenge, of course, is that, in fact, what makes you good is what's at your heart. That's one's part of the story. And then we get to what I would consider is a more uncomfortable story. The story of the Canaanite woman asking for healing for her daughter. The observation that confession matters leads us to see how important it is to live our confession. What strikes me about what the Canaanite woman does is her confession leads to her, her request being granted. You see, you may have missed it because it's a part of our common um, vocabulary, but to say son of David is to make a direct claim upon the person or persons you're talking about. That was to speak that you are ancestor of David. And in this context, that is a statement to say that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So when she says, have mercy on me, son of David, she is making a claim about who Christ is in that moment. The thing that is interesting in this moment also isn't so much that Jesus gives her what she wants from the get-go. And I say that with a certain amount of uncomfortableness with how Jesus responds to her. 
if and when I enter heaven, Jesus and I are going to have a conversation. Trust me. I understand that while I was not there, and I understand how easy it is to get frustrated with people demanding stuff of you, I think his approach was a little problematic at best. He first sets her apart from the community, which she already knew. But this is the funny thing about it. In spite of that, she works within that worldview. She works within the understanding that was being presented to her. It's weird. He comes away and says, it's not good to throw the stuff to the dogs. I want to point out something. Some of you have probably seen the recent um, Facebook post that happened yesterday with our dog and pancakes, but I'm not going to talk about that right now, but I'll just let you look at my wife's timeline. You'll get an understanding of what I'm talking about. But the interesting thing is she responds by saying, yet we get the crumbs also, which is a weird thing because she's challenging his notion of what she should have or that she should have something, yet she is still within the worldview that she is a dog. She affirms that which really makes me feel uncomfortable, but it presents itself in a way that challenges the very notion of that worldview. A part of having a confession is not just holding it when it is comfortable or when it is easy, but also holding a confession when it is hard, when it is not uncomfortable, when it is uncomfortable, when it is in direct conflict with what is believed by a wider community. The value of a confession is its lived practice. Let me say that again. The value of a confession is its lived practice. A living confession is the most valuable confession. See, when I look at the nature of what confessions are, I see that there are three modes or ways that confessions work. One is the encountered confession Two is the express confession, and three is the lived confession. I wanted to explore this with you for a moment. An encountered confession, that's when we look at a statement that we encounter in the course of our faith. In the Presbyterian book, uh, or in the Constitution, we have this thing called the Book of Confessions, where our statements of faith, right? And this is a resource for study within the community. It is saying that these statements speak to where the church understood itself in a particular time, under particular circumstances, posed with a particular problem or threat, and how it decided to respond in that moment, in that time, under those circumstances. This is important because it gives structure to what we believe. It gives us a roadmap to how our faith has become what it is today. It is also a way of 
exploring what we now believe in reference to what has been believed. And that's important. Second is the express confession. This is what we say we believe. Often in the communities of faith, there will be a moment in time in worship when we will express one or parts of a confession. This is really powerful because it unites us around a set of doctrines that we work out of. It is also powerful in so much when the church is tasked with understanding what is the role it needs to play in any time and point. Often in Presbytery work um, meetings, when we have to debate a hotly hot issue, we will look to the confessions to help strengthen our understanding of what's going on. In the same way as a lawyer might use the Constitution as to help strengthen his argument in front of the court. In this way that the express confession states what it what our best aims ought to be and gives us a vision of where we ought to go. These are important tasks that the confession can do for us. But probably the most important, the one that I would submit is superseded all these is the lived confession. When you grow and reproduce your beliefs in a specific context based upon what you say you believe. For me, the task of the community is about doing that. The task of the community is about looking at these resources we have in the history of our church, born of the scriptural witness that has grown through the history of the church and has come to fruit now. And a part of what we do in the community is bear witness to that and then live that through our daily life. When thinking about this, a story came to my mind. A part of a lot of the confessions in the Presbyterian Book of Order is this concept of an unearned covenant that Christ has with those who believe. Early, or I would say, in the middle of my father's cancer diagnosis, when things became apparent that things were not going to get better, probably. I remember leaving dad. And I remember saying to him as left, trust in the covenant you have in your baptism." that Christ will see you through. We knew what we were talking about because we had studied these texts. We knew what it was. But for me to reference that was to give him a sense of hope when all other hope had perished. And it is that ability to claim something, that phrase about covenant and about how we are God's chosen, 
not because of what we have done, but because of what God's grace through Christ has offered us. I hope that it gave him a framework to work through the anger, the frustration, the suffering. It is as a church that we have to come with these resources to help people make meaningful confessions in their lives. For me, that is to summarize what is the task of ministry, is to live the confession of what we believe. Not just in the good times, but also in the bad. May it be so for us. Amen, amen, amen.